Hello everybody, and welcome to this electronics tutorial brought to you by Droid Builders Live. My name is Will Evans, and today I'm going to be giving you a couple of tips and tricks you can use when trying to design your own droid. Now, a quick disclaimer, this is not going to be like a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to make your own droid. Instead, it's just going to give you a couple of tips, um, some advice, maybe some checklists to follow, just to help you get ahead and debug any problems you're having when you're trying to make your own design. That said, let's get into it. So, here we are. Electronics Basics Droid Edition. Mm -hmm. In this talk, I'm going to cover some basic electronics theory, and then how we can apply that to make our droids a bit safer using resistors and fuses. Uh, then we're going to talk a bit about motors and, and batteries and how to move our droids safely. And then I'm going to talk a bit about sensing and signals and how to sort of make your droid a bit smarter if you'd like to. And then finally we're going to finish up with some tips on assembling your electronics control board and maybe some equipment recommendations to help make that a lot easier. But first, me! As I said before, my name is Will Evans, and I have been building for about eight years now. Uh, the first one I ever started was BB-8, after seeing the Force Awakens trailer. I'm a product designer for a medical robotics company, so I, I like to think I know what I'm talking about. And I've got a, a master's degree in electronic engineering. Here is a collection of some of the droids that I have built, or I'm still building. Um, all of them are unfinished, obviously. Uh, this is a picture of something I made while I was at university, actually. I, I made, um, this is the LR18 electric vehicle on the track at Silverstone. Uh, I was the team's electrical safety officer for, for this. And uh, on the bottom we've got a picture of some of my droids in various states of completion. Uh, big shout out to the Dalek in the bottom right hand side. I know it's not Star Wars, but the Dalek is a lot bigger than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> anyway, now moving into the talk properly. First up, there's a disclaimer. There is going to be some theory in here, but it is all relevant to droid building. Uh, hopefully, I'm going to give you some tools that you can apply to, to really help you figure out sort of what components you need, what resistors you'll need. All of this stuff is really useful, so stick with it, and it will come in handy later on, I promise. So first of all, um, obviously this is a talk on electronics. We need to come up with some definitions for the bits of electronics we need to think about. And the first of those bits is the voltage. Now, voltage is the push on the electricity. It's the force moving it through the wires. The second thing we're going to talk about is current, and that is the amount of electricity flowing, it's the movement of the electricity. And lastly, we can talk about resistance. Now resistance is the stopping force, or the force opposing the movement of current. It's good to think of it in terms of this picture, actually. So you've got the volts giving a, the electricity a shove through the wires, you've got the amps actually moving and then you have the ohms, the resistance, stopping the amps from moving through the wires easily. A very useful bit of maths for electronics is called Ohm's Law. Now, what Ohm's Law says is that the voltage is equal to the current times resistance. Um, you can rearrange Ohm's Law in lots of different ways to find all the different parts of, of electronics that we've just talked about, and another one including power. You can see in this wheel on the right hand side, there's all the different configurations of the equation V equals I times R. Now V equals I times R means voltage is equal to current times resistance. Uh, we can also find power by using Ohm's law, and power is equal to current times voltage. Now for example, uh, if we were going to use this, we would, um, let's take a motor, for example, this is a scooter motor, um, lots of people use those for their uh, R2-D2 drives, 
Um, this motor is 120 watts and is powered by 24 volts. So applying the uh, equation in the top left hand corner, I equals P over V, we can do 120 divided by 24 and that will give us a current of 5 amps. So now we know the current that will be flowing through this motor. And that's how you apply Ohm's law. We can also talk about Kirchhoff's laws. Now, Kirchhoff's laws explain how electricity behaves in different situations. Um, for example, we know that from the first law, all voltage is used up in a loop. So if you have a closed loop between the positive and negative terminal of a battery, regardless of what is in that loop, the drop will be equal to the voltage. So in this case, we've got a 9 volt battery, three resistors, but we know that all of those 9 volts are going to be used up. The second law states that the voltage into a split is the same in all splits. So let's say we've got V1 coming into this junction and it splits into V2 and V3. All of those voltages are the same. V2 and V3 both get the same as V1. However, the third law states that the current behaves differently. So if we have the current coming into a split, so I1 comes into our split and splits into I2 and I3, this current does split in half. So we end up with I2 and I3 adding together to make I1. It's opposite to the voltage. Now, why is this kind of stuff useful to know in terms of droid building? Well, let's say we have a battery here and then two lights, two sets of lights. Um, if we have a five volt battery from our Kirchhoff second law, we know that each of these lights will also receive five volts because there's, there's a branch, there's a split. Then we can think that if this first light receives one amp of current and the second light receive two amps of current, we remember from Kirchhoff's third law that the current into a, into a junction splits. We must know that the source current that needs to be provided by this battery is three amps. And now we know the voltage and the current, we can calculate the power needed. So we know that it's 15 uh, watts of power being provided by the battery. And then this first light receives five watts and this second light receives 10 watts of power. So now we know that we can use Ohm's law to calculate certain electrical properties that we don't know. But what happens if we calculate certain properties and realize that that's dangerous for our component? Well, then we can calculate protection resistors and they'll keep all of our, our currents and voltages within safe limits for the bits we're using. And I, I often jokingly refer to this as magic smoke. If you put too much current through a component, it lets out the magic smoke and, and then the component stops working. So we've talked about resistance being a property of electronics, but you can actually use specific components that have set values of resistance to keep things safe. Now we can calculate these resistors again from Ohm's law being rearranged to make R the subject, so resistance is equal to voltage divided by the current. But we can also add certain values of resistance together and, and to change the, the values. So if we put two resistors in series, they will add their resistors together. But if we put two resistors in parallel, they will actually decrease the resistance. The inverse is true. So if we show that in a picture, you can see that the resistors in series are end to end and they have the total resistance of R1 plus R2 plus R3. But on the right, if we've got the resistors in parallel, it's the inverse. So we have one over the total resistance is equal to one over the first resistor plus one over the second resistor. Now, I also talked about Kirchhoff's first law saying that all voltage is used up in a loop. And that's true, but we can also look at the different proportions of the voltage that are used up 
at different points in that loop. And we use this uh, thing called a potential divider to, to split up the voltage. And the potential divider looks like this. So you'll see we've got our closed loop between the positive and the negative terminals of the battery, and we've got two resistors in series in there. Now, it's really good to think about the way voltage dividers work using something called pizza theory. Say we have a really big pizza, and we're going to split it between two people. We've got this little chap here, giving us a wave, and we have his much bigger dad. Now, because the dad is so much bigger, that means he's going to get a lot more of the pizza. The same is true with resistors. If you have a small resistor and a big resistor, the big resistor gets a larger proportion of that voltage. And the way we calculate that ratio is using this equation. So you have the resistance that you want to calculate the voltage of divided by the total resistance multiplied by the input voltage. So why is something like this useful? Okay, let's let's come up with a problem that we need to solve. We have batteries that are overheating. Well, then we can change the second resistor in our voltage divider to be a temperature sensitive resistor called a thermistor. And then we can attach this voltage output to our Arduino analog input. And that way, when the temperature of our batteries changes, the value of R2, the temperature sensitive resistor, will change and it'll get a different proportion of the voltage, which then allows our Arduino, our microcontroller, to sense that change and alert us to the fact that our batteries might be overheating. We can also use resistors to protect Arduinos in other ways. So we have a brand spanking new Arduino Uno right here. It costs £20 if you buy a brand new one from an official source, maybe even more. And some of the electronic properties are, it works at 5 volts, it can provide 200 milliamps in total, but each leg of this Arduino chip can only provide 40 milliamps. Any more, and the chip will get damaged and it might let out its magic smoke. What we do is, using Ohm's law, we know the voltage and the current, and we need to calculate the resistance required to keep this current within this safe limit of 40 milliamps. So we put our numbers in and we come up with a value of resistance for 125 ohms. So if we were to connect our voltage, uh, our Arduino pin to negative to ground, we would need a 125 ohm resistor to keep it safe. Now the way resistance values are communicated on resistors uh, is using colours. They don't write the number of the resistor on the side, instead they use uh, the rainbow, each colour signifying a different number of resistance. And you can figure out what the value is by using this table. Now you can buy set values of resistance from something called the E12 range, which is a set of 12 resistors, each with a common uh, resistance value. You can also buy from something called the E24 range, which has 24 values, so there are some values in between each of these. Uh, something very interesting, very useful to note, is that you should always choose the bigger value of resistance. If you remember when we calculated our Arduino protection resistor at 125 ohms, that's halfway between the, the 12 and the 15 value on our E12 range. Now, even though 125 would be closest to the 12 value, you should, you should choose the 15 value because it's, it's bigger, so you've got a safety margin. You don't want to use the one that's slightly smaller because then you won't be protecting your, your Arduino properly. We've talked about how resistors can be used as protection features. But now we need to talk about slightly more heavy duty protection features like fuses. So a fuse protects against super high current. Wires have a resistance and the resistance causes heating. That's why your, your televisions and radios get warm when you use them. 
but if you have super high currents going through them, like the sort of currents you'll need to drive a heavy R2-D2 up a hill, that can get to the point where your wires will start melting or you're setting things on fire. So to protect against this, we use a fuse, which is a, a safe point of weakness. It's much better for the fuse to melt than for your wires to melt. And the way we calculate our fuse is uh, normally it would be um, your sort of normal use current times 1.25 as your fuse rating. But I'd probably suggest instead you, you take the standard value fuse you can buy easily that's just above your safe maximum current. So if your R2-D2 driving uphill will draw 13.7 amps current, you would need a 15 amp fuse to protect your R2-D2 from melting or setting on fire, should you be doing that for a long time. Fuses can come in fast blow or slow blow configurations. So if, if you have, um, let's say you're 13.7 and you get a 20 amp fuse, you'd probably want a fast blow fuse. Whereas if you had a 13.7 amp current draw and then you use a 14 amp fuse, you'd want a slow blow fuse because chances are your your current would, would hover around the 14 amp fuse and maybe trip it. Uh, apply a bit of common sense, but uh, as a rough general rule, take your, your normal current times 1.25 and that'll give you a nice value of, of your fuse to, to save your R2-D2. Now, because wires have heating, we also need to know what sort of current they can take to make sure that the fuse is our known point of weakness. As a general rule, the thicker the wire, the more current it can carry. And we can use tables from Google to, to figure out the sort of wire gauge we need. And you can see from here that it says a conductor of half a millimetre square can only take about three amps, whereas two millimetres can take about 20 amps. Uh, you can also use uh, AWG wire ratings for current capacity as well. Um, that works slightly differently, but the principle's the same. The thicker the wire, the more current it can carry. So how do you calculate this? It's exactly the same as your fuse. So it's the standard value above your safe peak current. So if you have 13.7 amps of current, you would need a 1.5 millimeter wire because that gives you a safe current of 15 amps. With fuses and wires, you should always choose the bigger value. If you choose a smaller value for a wire, it might break or melt or set on fire. And if you use a smaller value for your fuse, it might trip during safe normal operation. And there'd be nothing worse than driving around an event and having your R2-D2 suddenly cut out. Now we're on to the good stuff. And that good stuff is motors and motor drivers. There are two main types of motor we tend to use with our R2-D2s and our droids. And they are brushed motors versus brushless motors. Now you might have heard brushed and brushless referred to as DC motors and AC motors. And the way these two work is fundamentally different. You cannot chop and change them. A brushed motor uses direct current. So you add a battery to it and as long as there's a connection between the positive and negative, the motor will start to spin. A brushless motor works a bit like a stepper motor in that you need to turn off and on each of the individual wires to make it tick around. And then depending on how fast you do this ticking is how fast the motor runs. There are some pros and cons to each different one. Um, we'll start with the brushed motors. The pros of a brushed motor is that they're cheap, they're, they're older, they're more affordable, they've been around a lot longer. They're also pretty simple. With brushless motors, you need to have uh, complicated electronics, but for brushed motors, you can use a switch or a relay or, or honestly just connect it directly to a battery and your, your brushed motor will work. Um, brushed motors tend to come with built-in gear reductions as a standard, so instead of having to 3D print or cut out from metal special gears to make your motor work at the right sort of torque, um, instead you can just buy a ready-built motor that already runs at the right speed and torque for you. Now some cons of brushed motors are, because they use brushes to give the electricity to the motor, these brushes eventually wear out as the motor spins a lot. 
So they will need replacing, but that's after years of use. Um, they can also be quite noisy. They, they tend to spark and crackle a lot as they run if, they, if they're getting old. So you might need to add some sort of noise proofing to make sure your R2-D2 doesn't crackle and scream as he drives around. And on the other hand, brushless motors, they are a lot more powerful. They, they tend to be more powerful. And they're a lot more efficient than brushed motors. They can also run very fast, depending on how fast you switch your, your power supply. And uh, they can also be a lot quieter. But some of the cons of brushless motors are they're more expensive to buy. Now, the price gap between the two is, is changing as brushless motors become more and more common. But brushless motors tend to be a lot more expensive than brushed motors of the same sort of power. Brushless motors also tend to be used for drones or aeroplanes, remote control aeroplanes. And so the aim is speed. So you would need to have a gear reduction built in uh, or 3D printed to make your brushless motor usable. But what should we use for R2? A lot of people recommend the Sabertooth setup using scooter motors and standard RC servos for animation. So here we can see the Sabertooth with its lovely big heat sinks on the back. You can also see standard scooter motor, you can buy those off eBay with no problems. And you can get plenty of servo motors for quite cheap for opening pie panels and doors on his side. Um, recently, I've seen a couple of people discussing the, the use of um, O drives and Q85 motors. Um, the Q85, as far as I can tell, is an electric bike motor, so it has plenty of torque for driving R2 around. Um, and an O drive is a very precise dual brushless motor controller. Uh, you can buy encoders to go on it or you can control it through serial ports as well. The O drive is very configurable and um, can go up to quite high currents as well. So if you're looking to future proof your R2, I would probably recommend looking into something like that instead. Uh, the final thing to say about motors is, regardless of what size you're using, you should always check that your electronic speed controller rating is larger than your motor's maximum current or you will set your speed controller on fire. That is a fact. Everyone has done it. I've set two on fire in the past year. Just be careful and make sure you size everything properly. Okay, you have been warned. We've talked about driving our R2-D2 using motors, but now we need to talk about how we power those motors. So now I'm going to discuss the, the different properties of different battery chemistries and some safety things you need to think about when using different batteries. If you use your batteries wrong, they will set on fire without a doubt. Batteries are getting better and safer and there's all sorts of circuits you can buy now to protect them. But still, your batteries, you need to be careful. They can light things on fire. So batteries use a chemical reaction to release electrons which flow through an external circuit. Adding two batteries in series combines their voltages and adding two batteries in parallel combines their capacity. So if we were to have two 12 volt batteries and we were to put them end to end, we would end up with 24 volts. However, if we had two 12 volt batteries and we stuck them in parallel, we would end up with a 12 volt battery that lasted twice as long. You cannot combine different battery chemistries or different battery capacities. They can cause currents to flow backwards through your battery or you can end up discharging one battery into the other because it's a different chemistry and, and they will get hot and set on fire. You do, just don't risk it. You might think you're OK, but it's safer to not combine different battery chemistries. Just avoid that at all costs. So different battery chemistries you can buy. I'm just going to talk about the most common ones. The first one is lead acid. That's the sort of thing that's in your car. 
big old car batteries. They're big, they're, they're heavy, they're quite cheap for the capacity they are, but they can't provide very high current. Um, you can get nickel metal hydride batteries, which are, are a standard RC configuration. They've been going for a long time. Um, a variation of the, the nickel metal hydride called a nickel cadmium uh, suffered from a problem called battery memory, where if you only half discharged your battery and then charged it up again, you would end up being only able to use half of the battery next time you came to use the battery. I don't think the, the hydride batteries have this problem, but it's something uh, worth thinking about. Now we're moving into the sort of more modern batteries. The new RC standard battery is, is a lithium polymer battery. They're, they're small, they've got very high capacity. They can be a fire hazard, so you need to be careful when you're using them. Uh, and then finally, we have lithium ion batteries, which are brand spanking new, and they're super high capacity. They're still a bit of a fire hazard, but they're much safer than the polymer batteries. Um, and they, they're quite expensive, actually. Um, lithium ion batteries, in fact, the picture I've used here of an 18650 cell is what's used in Teslas. Very interesting. Now batteries store energy, that's how they work. You put energy into them and the chemicals store it for later use. Battery capacity is measured in amp hours or watt hours, which we know from our Ohm's law from the very first slides. But basically an amp hour is the amount of amps that can be supplied for one hour before the battery runs flat. So if you have a 20 amp hour battery, you can provide 20 amps for one hour or one amp for 20 hours, depending on your sort of current requirements. We also talk about a C rating, which is the maximum discharge current as a function of its capacity. So if we have a, a one amp battery with 15 C, you can actually provide 15 amps safely from this battery. You also need safety circuits. I would recommend all the safety circuits you can fit into your droids. Um, moving from the left to the right, we have a battery management system that automatically cuts off your battery once it drops below a certain voltage. Um, the next one is an alarm that you plug into certain batteries that just buzzes annoyingly when you start to drop below a certain voltage. And then the last two are, are power meters. So this one shows you the voltage left in, in your battery. And then the right one shows um, the percentage of the voltage left. You, you need some sort of monitoring system in your droid to make sure you don't over discharge your battery because then it can become a fire hazard. Um, plus it would be nice to know that you aren't going to have to push a fully aluminium droid back up the hill to your car. It would be helpful to have him drive his own way there. <laughs> DC DC converters are also very useful when talking about batteries. Here's a handful of DC DC converters from one that can do 5 volts 2 amps to one that can do 36 volts at 10 amps. They make your, your battery voltages usable. So if you have a 36 volt battery, you can then using a converter power your motors, your speakers, your motors and um, any logic and, and receivers and transmitters and, and computers you've got on board, all from the same battery, instead of having to use five different batteries. You will need DC-DC converters. I cannot stress that enough. It's much cheaper than buying five different battery sizes. Now, chargers. Batteries need charging. A lot of batteries come with their own chargers, but certain ones need a special charger. Um, this is the lithium polymer charger that I own. It's a balanced charger that makes sure that um, each of the cells inside the battery stays nicely charged and, and they don't start to become too different. Um, lead acid batteries tend to just come with chargers you can plug in. Um, conversely, if you're using a battery management system, you can just plug in a normal charger and the, the battery itself will balance itself to make sure it doesn't overcharge or undercharge. Charge safely. 
there's many different variables that go into charging. There's different capacities, there's different current ratings, there's different time frames. Do a bit of research onto the battery that you're buying and, and charge it safely. If it's a one amp battery, don't try and charge it at 10 amps. Conversely, if it's a 10 amp battery, it's going to take forever to charge it at one amp. Now, certain batteries to buy, I would recommend uh, a bog standard lithium polymer battery. It's a RC standard, uh, three cells tend to run at about 12 volts, um, and you can buy them in capacities from anything down as low as one amp to, to five and a half amp hours. So there's a good range you can get, and they're all nicely affordable as well. Plus, if you put two of these batteries in series, you can up it to 24 volts, which is a nice standard voltage to use with our droids. If you're after something a bit bigger, you can buy um, a hoverboard battery, an electric scooter battery. Now, these are 10 cell lithium ion batteries that run at about 36 volts. And this one is about 5 amp hours. I use this in some of my droids and other projects, in fact. And um, it's big, it lasts for ages, and it, it uses high voltage, so you, there's less losses from, from heating in the wires. Um, buy good quality batteries. You might be able to get one off eBay from China for half the price. But there is no guarantee that it's a real battery. They might have skimped on the quality of the cells. If there's one thing you're going to, to buy properly, it should be your battery. You don't want to have a fire hazard in your, in your garage. I tend to source them from Hobby King or, or other model shops because these people selling you these batteries know that you need to have a reliable battery that lasts a long time and works properly. So go, go to a reputable source to buy your batteries don't skimp on the quality. Sensing and signals. There are lots of different modules you can add to your droid. There are lots of different sensors you can you can add to give it different functionality. And I'm just going to give a quick rundown of all of the sort of things you can use to make your droid a bit smarter. Here are a bunch of common modules that I actually use in pretty much all of my droids. Um, first up, we've got a, the MPU6050, which is a gyroscope. That's used for calculating angles and, and movement. It's used for balancing BB-8. Uh, underneath that, we've got the, the PCA9685, which is a servo motor controller. Um, it uses a communication protocol called I2C, or I squared C to control up to 16 different servo motors off of one pin. Now this is also um, an incredibly useful board because you can actually daisy chain them together so you can control up to well, as many addresses as you can be bothered to come up with, as many boards as you own, just by connecting each of these boards together. But it allows you to control 16 servo motors off of one pin. Then we've got everybody's favourite lights, NeoPixels. These are some uh, very special lights that um, you daisy chain together in a big long line and you can control them. They're, they're red, blue, green LEDs. It really reduces the complexity of wiring and allows you to get all sorts of colour ranges on them. USB host shields are recommended for allowing you to use your own controllers. Um, they can let you can communicate to your droid using a PlayStation controller or or an Xbox, or even a computer and mouse if you want to. Lots of different people recommend lots of different sound effects boards. I personally like the Adafruit audio effects soundboard. I find it very simple to use, and it also has a lot of functionality. You can trigger different sounds from different pins. You can set up randomly occurring sounds. You can um, do all sorts. You can even communicate with it over serial. So you can trigger all of these different things from one pin. And of course, there's the relay board that lots of people recommend. We talked about the Arduino only being able to source a little bit of current. But with the relay board, you can use this little current to switch a relay to power much 
bigger things like motors and lights. And of course, all of these modules that are mentioned here and, and many others have Arduino libraries and tutorials. So you can just click and drag each of the different blocks into your code and they will really make it much more simple for you to add all of this additional functionality to your robot. Let's discuss a few examples of sort of the things we can do using these modules. So let's say we want to give our big heavy R2D2 some collision detection. There's a couple of different modules you can use for this. Um, you can use an ultrasonic distance sensor to sort of use echolocation in a crowd to make sure it doesn't bump into things. Um, you can use a passive infrared sensor to detect people's body heat. Um, if you're going a bit fancier, you can use a computer on board and something like an Xbox Connect that has facial recognition or object recognition and make it truly autonomous and, and drive itself around very safely. Um, you could even have something like a microphone to detect when it's in a crowd and, and limit its own speed to, to half to make sure it doesn't accidentally run over people's toes. What about BB-8? You could add position hold to your BB-8 using certain modules here. We obviously need an accelerometer and gyroscope to make sure he balances himself. But you can also attach a rotary encoder onto his motors. And if somebody nudges BB-8, he'll sense a movement and he'll know to roll back to the position he was already in. The same is true of DO, in fact. You can, you can add this on any balancing robot to make sure that they stay put when you leave them. They don't balance themselves down a hill, if that makes sense. You could do something completely frivolous and turn your mouse droid into a portable disco um, using a sound effects board and some neopixels to give it nice popping lights from behind its circuit boards. There's, there's so much you can do. And it, it's, it really just leaves it up to your own imagination, how you apply all of these things to make your creations that much more interactive. So I definitely encourage you to go absolutely wild and see what sort of devices you can come up with. So now we're coming to the end. I want to tie all of these different bits together and talk about how to logically lay out our droids and maybe give a couple of equipment recommendations as well. So, there is a big difference between the board on the left and the board on the right. I would not want to be dealing with the one on the left if there was a fault with my droid while I was out in an event. But the, the board on the right is a lot clearer to see what's going on in it. So to help us debug certain bits, I would recommend a multimeter. It doesn't have to be a fantastic one. You can buy a fairly cheap one, but multimeters really help detect sort of what kind of resistors you're using, what voltages your motors are receiving, whether there's continuity between two components that there shouldn't be, whether you've got a short circuit. Multimeters are super useful. I get a decent soldering iron. You can get cheap ones. I'd pay for a mid-range one just because the temperature is more accurate and they tend to have an assortment of different tips you can use depending on what you're soldering. Um, I would get a crimp tool and some crimps. You might think you'll get away with soldering everything. I used to think the same until I got a crimp tool and now I tend to use that for most of my connections. It's super simple. You don't need to break the bank. Just buy a, a kit off eBay and, and it'll do you the world of good. Um, you definitely need heat shrink tube to protect your lights and components from short circuiting. I'd also get a barbecue lighter. Lots of people just use their soldering iron to do it, but I find the heat shrink tends to make my soldering iron a bit grubby and dirty. Basic wire strippers are a must. You can do it with a knife or some scissors, but it's a lot simpler to just use wire strippers. You don't need to break the bank. You can buy a cheap set off eBay for next to nothing. A solder sucker is also useful. 
a desolder braid, you, you will make mistakes. You'll realise you've put the chip in the wrong way round, or you'll have put the wrong resistors in because you misread the colours. A desolder a, a braid or a solder sucker, it just makes it so much easier to get components back out. If you want to chance it, thinking you won't make mistakes, be my guest, but in my experience, everybody makes mistakes. A clean workspace is invaluable. You do not want to short your circuits because when we're dealing with certain bits of electronics like our saber tooths or motor controllers, if you put it down and test it on a metal table or a table that's got different bits of metal shavings on it, you could start a fire. You don't want to break your components. You need to make sure you keep your electronics surface nice and clean. Another thing to think about when we're building our droids is, is the interference. So let's say we've got a nice big motor here in our droid, and then we put our receiver and our Arduino right next to it. When this motor moves, it's going to generate a lot of noisy electricity that's going to sort of wash over our Arduino. And we can end up getting interference and phantom signals. So our droid might drive when we don't want it to, or it might turn slowly when we want it to turn fast. And the way we can fix this interference is by putting our motor and our receiver quite far apart, and maybe even putting a sheet of metal between the two of them. You can also buy uh, ferrite chokes, so little iron rings that go around sensitive wires. Um, lots of people would be tempted, maybe, to put it in a metal box. It would work to stop interference, that's true, but it would also stop your radio signals getting through, so we'd end up with a, an uncontrollable droid. Well, we've reached the point where I've gone through pretty much everything that I can, so we're going to now build our own virtual electronics board for our droid. And the first thing we need to do is have something to mount it to. Lots of people use just a standard chopping board, you could use a block of wood, you could use a sheet of plastic, you just need something to attach everything to to make it nice and simple to look at. Then we're going to need our batteries. I've opted to use two three cell lithium polymer batteries here, connected together to make 24 volts. We obviously need a switch. The switch needs to be rated at the maximum current that we're going to be drawing through our batteries. We also need a fuse to make sure that if there's a short circuit for whatever reason or our R2 breaks down, we can be certain that it will stop. We're not going to continue setting things on fire as we drive around. Then we're going to add our saber tooth motor controller. This is a nice big thing. It takes 24 volts in. And then we're going to add our motors and some fuses. Now, some of the Sabertooth controllers do recommend you don't use a fuse or, or back EMF can uh, break the motor controller when it, it moves. Um, all I can recommend is you read your data sheet. The instructions that come with your Sabertooth on how you can sort of configure it. Then after we've put the voltage into our saber tooth, we need to step it down from 24 volts to 12 volts to use in, uh, say, our head motor. So for dome rotation, we're going to use a small motor controller and a smaller motor. But also we need to power our amplifier for our sound effects and speakers. Once we've put that in, we can then take a 6 volt regulator and put it into our servo controller board to control a bunch of servos for us, for all sorts of animation. Then we need a 5 volt regulator to power everything else, like our receiver, our Arduino, and all sorts of lights and other modules that we've got plugged in. Then after we've got all of this laid out really nice and logically, we can start to add all of our wires in. Now an important thing to mention here is that age-old argument that's been going on as to whether you put your voltage into each of the regulators separately or whether you step it down sequentially. So do we put 12, uh, 24 volts into our 12 volt converter and our 6 volt converter 
or do we step it down from 24 to 12 and then 12 to 6 and then 6 to 5? In theory, you can do either. It wouldn't matter that much because the electronics are designed for this sort of thing. However, I wouldn't recommend it. I would instead get the converters that step down from your battery voltage itself. Um, that would also be a slightly, slightly more efficient, but we're only talking a couple of percent here and there. So there's no real need to do it one way or the other, but I would recommend you don't daisy chain them. Mark was nice enough to send me a couple of pictures of his layout and we can see it's beautiful. Look at how pretty that looks. We've got his big bank of fuses in one corner. All of his safety features are there. Next to the fuses, we have a, a battery monitor to show us the voltage of the batteries so far, if we need to change it or, or, or swap out the batteries for new ones. Right near the front, we have a switch that's got an indicator on, clearly showing us whether the droid is turned on or off. And then in the bottom left, we've got our saber tooth motor and then another motor driver all grouped together. There's a sound effects board next to that. There's a big, big amplifier for his speakers. And then next to that, we've got our Arduino, in this case, an Arduino Mega, and the USB host shield to allow him to control it using whatever controller he'd like to. This is a beautiful example of layout. You can see if anything goes wrong, you can know exactly where it is and you'll be able to follow it through very easily. Mark has even included uh, a nice connector to allow him to unplug the rest of the droid from the board so, so he can take the board out for maintenance without having to cut or clip or, or do anything to separate the, the dome from the board, for example. I think this is a wonderful example of a logically laid out board. Well done, Mark, and thank you very much for sending it through. Well, I'm very sorry to say that we have reached the end. Electronics has come to an end. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. Um, I know it's been quite long, but I hope you've at least learned a couple of tips and tricks that would help you design your own droids. Just to have a quick recap over everything I've done, condense it into one slide. Basic electronics theory is always useful. Remember your Ohm's law, V equals I times R. That'll calculate your resistors, your motor powers, everything you could possibly need to know. Data sheets are your friend. You can always find data sheets for the components you get, whether it comes in the instructions or you just have a quick cursory Google. You'll always be able to find how you're supposed to use your components. You should always choose the value above. Your resistors need to be bigger. Your wire gauges need to be bigger. Your Speed controller currents need to be bigger than what they're used for. You can't have it just on the edge because there's a chance you'll set it on fire. Battery alarms are very important. You need some way of monitoring your battery. You don't want to set your house on fire. Don't try and reinvent the wheel. There's so many different pre-built libraries or sensors. You can drop in pre-built modules to do things for your droid without having to spend hours designing them yourself. You need to keep it simple. Logical layout is a must. You need to make it easy to find mistakes or, or problems or errors or faults. And there will be a lot of them. Clean up your soldering station. You need to keep the area that you're making your electronics clean. You don't want to damage anything by accident especially because electronics is quite hard to debug if you don't help yourself out. And finally, if you have any questions, you can ask them. The beauty of it being a builder's club is that there's so many people doing all the same stuff and we can help each other out. There's forums, there's Facebook pages, there's friends. If you're ever stuck with anything or just after some advice, you can message anybody. Well, we've reached the end. That's all, folks.
once again, thank you for listening to this. Uh, thank you to the guys for organising Droid Builders Live. It's nice to have something go ahead, even if we can't be all together showing off our creations. Um, I'd like to thank Rob Howdle for helping me out um, with some of this. Lee Towersy for being very patient when I was making this presentation. I'm sorry it's so long, Lee. <laughs> and thank you to Mark for sending through some of his pictures because it just it's nice to be able to see someone else's work and be able to check your own against it to see if you're doing the right sort of thing good luck everyone happy building and i will see you at the next event when we're all allowed back out stay safe